Michael Judd has worked with agroecological and whole system designs throughout the Americas for nearly two decades, focusing on applying permaculture and ecological design. His projects increase local food security and community health in both tropical and temperate growing regions. He's the founder of Ecolo Ecologia, um, edible and ecological landscape design and project Bonafide, an international nonprofit supporting agroecology research. And he's also the author of Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist and For the Love of Pawpaws. And with that, we're excited to pass it over to Michael. Thanks for being here, Michael. All right. So today's uh, presentation, Edible Landscaping with a Permaculture Twist, will be largely focusing on design. Uh, things that can be applicable across uh, different climates and regions in the U.S., really across the globe. Uh, though most of us and many of us seem to be in the in the Washington, D.C. area, the mid-Atlantic, I will be sharing a few of my favorite fruits, uh, some of which you can see here in this opening slide. Uh, but to give you a little bit of uh, backdrop, uh, this presentation is largely based on my book, Edible Landscaping with Permaculture Twist, which is a very how-to oriented uh, manual. And a lot of the pictures that I'll share today are coming via the book. Um, so if you want more details, of course, you can find them there. I'll also share a few uh, slides and images from my more recent book, For the Love of Paw Paws, uh, which of course focuses on this fabulous tropical fruit that grows in the north but also gets into some edible landscaping and permaculture design uh, set up you know, for success, really, uh, regardless of what you're growing. Um, this is where I'm coming to you from. Uh, we live in the foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Maryland. And this is a circular straw bale home that we built uh, from the woods that surround us, straw bales, traditional lime plasters, living roof, and this sits at the center of our homestead. We call it Long Creek Homestead. And a permaculture homestead is, is a holistic uh, design in the sense that it incorporates aspects of gardening, of forestry, of natural building, of social and economic, uh, social and, sorry, social, social and uh, economic design that makes everything flow together like a natural ecosystem. So we're, we'll be going over designs today that are part of permaculture. So instead of you know trying to expound on all of the potential design aspects of permaculture, uh, I'm gonna try and infuse the understanding of it through some simple designs. So I have to start by talking about pawpaws because we just finished the pawpaw season here. The harvest was wonderful. We have a pawpaw festival as well, uh, where we get over 500 happy souls coming out to experience trying the pawpaw, but also getting to sort of see our food forests and gardens, you know, how we grow mushrooms, our, our straw bale natural building. So it's it's almost a poster child to, to get folks out uh, to experience uh, a lot more. But the pawpaw itself is a phenomena in that it is the only member of the Anona family, which is the custard apple family that is in the tropics and subtropics. It's the only member of the family that has migrated north. And it migrated north over millenniums. Uh, on receding glaciers in the guts of giant sloths and mastodons to slowly adapt all the way up into modern day southern Ontario and Canada. Uh, so we're talking about a very unique, a very adaptive species here. And it is a tropical fruit that grows in the north. It is absolutely exquisite in flavor. And I feel confident to say that um, because I lived and worked in the tropics for 18 years of my life. And sorry, I think I, I think I've undid myself there. Okay. And I grew many members of this family. And this Paul Paul of the North is one of the best fruits I've ever had. Uh, it has a custard-like consistency. 
It has flavors of mango and pineapple and banana uh, in its in its sort of um, best state, meaning harvested properly and having good genetics. It is like nature's dessert. Uh, so I really highly recommend people to to find the opportunity to one grow it if you can, and then if not, try it uh, because it is like nothing else that grows around us. And one of the reasons we're not more familiar with the pawpaw is that it doesn't have a shelf life. So it's it's like a very ripe banana uh, where it will oxidize and ripen very quickly. So another good reason to be growing it yourself or getting it you know, from a local uh, farmer's market or grower. Now, within the pawpaw, as with many fruits, you're going to have a range from the wild fruit to sort of more selected and crossed bread fruit. So you can compare it to a wild crab apple and a golden delicious to some degree. So at the top there is what you're most likely to find in the wild along the CNO Canal in our region as a wild pawpaw. Now, it can be an absolutely delicious pawpaw or it could have a lot of strong bitter notes. Uh, it could be full of seeds and not a lot of flesh. Whereas the fruit on the bottom is one that's been selectively cultivated you know, over generations to have a have very fine flavor notes without bitterness or astringency in it, uh, very few seeds, lots of pulp, uh, and even the firmness of the flesh uh, can be in there. So um, that's to say that there are not fabulous uh, wild pawpaws because there are, and indeed some of the main cultivars in the nursery industry today come from wild found pawpaws that are exceptional uh so but when you're growing your own uh, ideally you're going to start with some of the best genetics uh, which means getting either a select seedling which means it's coming from trees that are all uh, grafted or getting a grafted tree itself now if you have a wild pawpaw already you can regraft those and i go into that in my book and, and grafting is really not that tricky it's very much like many other things in gardening, a matter of time, timing, and paying attention. Uh, so I encourage people to go for grafting uh, because it's very accessible, especially with the pawpaw, which is just behind apples and pears uh, in their ease to graft. And this even goes for outdoor grafting. So if you have an existing tree, if you're thinking right now, oh no, I got a pawpaw seedling, but I think it's from the wild or I don't know where it's from, you can graft that with a cultivar uh, and you'll be sure that you're getting some good fruit. Okay, so I call the pawpaw an edible landscape all-star. Now to kind of fit that category for me, it has to be low maintenance, it has to be aesthetically beautiful, productive and delicious. And the pawpaw hits on all of those. Uh, as you can see here, when the pawpaw is brought out into full sun, and yes, pawpaws do grow in full sun, they take on a beautiful pyramid-shaped tree. Uh, if it's in a good, happy spot, it can get 15 to 20 feet tall. Uh, I also keep mine pruned down to eight feet tall so they can fit into smaller spaces. Uh, you do need two pawpaws for cross-pollination. It's not a male-female, it's just two different, genetically different pawpaws. And actually, if you look closely at the base of this picture, you will see two trunks. This is actually two pawpaws planted together one foot apart at the same time and they've grown up as one tree but they cross pollinate each other so if you've got limited space and you want to grow pawpaws plant two to the same size at the same time in the same hole or one foot apart they'll grow out and they'll get the cross pollination and you can also keep those pruned down uh, even lower so you know you could you could if you were really after your pruning keep your pawpaws at eight feet tall by four feet wide so if that opens some possibilities for smaller yards, uh, I encourage it because it's a beautiful tree. And then the fall foliage is gorgeous, golden. Uh, and I think the architecture of the branches and the tree also has a pretty winter interest. Uh, just a low input, uh, troubled, you know, very little by insects or disease, and then very abundant. So if you've got good genetics, uh, you'll be looking at getting, you know, 30 plus pounds of fruit per tree. Uh, which is phenomenal. And again, they don't have a long shelf life, but the saving grace is that they pulp and freeze well. Uh, 
up to two years, pulp can stay in good condition. So you can pull it out, put it in your smoothies, uh, make ice cream with it. Uh, a lot of a lot of delicious recipes uh, for the pawpaw. These are pawpaws uh, in our food forest. And I'm going to talk about food forests in a little bit. It's kind of like a diversified orchard. Uh, but you can see that these are only about eight feet tall uh, and about four or five feet in length. I have these on about 10 foot spacing because I do prune them. I recommend if you have space to do 12 foot spacing on your pawpaws. That way, if you don't prune, uh, they'll still have plenty of room. And you don't need to do anything to your pawpaws. You don't need to prune them. Um, but, you know, don't try to climb a pawpaw tree, as I found. Uh, the branches are not very strong. So by keeping your trees low, you might you might prevent, uh, you know, trying to climb the tree. Because it's hard not to when you see those fruits hanging. Uh, they're very enticing to, to climb it. Uh, but this also allows for me to... Um, manage the tree for good light and air flow, uh, which is important for most all fruits. And then pawpaws produce on last year's growth. So last year's growth, the, the previous year's growth will have the buds that will produce the fruit. So when you're cutting your pawpaws back like this, you're stimulating a lot of new growth, which means that you're pulsing it for more fruit uh, and can actually keep the trees alive longer as well. And then you get these beauties flying around. This is the zebra swallowtail butterfly, which is uh, the only, it, its only host is the pawpaw. So if you've seen this butterfly, there's pawpaws around you. And generally speaking, in the mid-Atlantic, there are pawpaws everywhere. They are all in our woods, uh, in many neighborhoods. You'd be surprised how prevalent they are. Uh, once you start to recognize that they're there. And again, this is a magical creature that only lives with the, the pawpaw. And if you're not sold yet, uh, pawpaw cheesecake is phenomenal. Uh, the flavors go so well, uh, whether it's vegan or traditional. Uh, we have both recipes in my pawpaw book. I'm really fortunate to work with some four chefs and some really amazing um, cooks to come up with recipes for, for everyone, whether that's whole food or, like I say, old school traditional or vegan. There's something for everybody with the pawpaw. All right. Let's get into some design aspects. All right. So this is the herb spiral, or we shall we say garden spiral, because you can really grow any number of things in it. It's a really fun design. Uh, it's kind of almost cliche permaculture in the sense that it it stacks a lot of functions. So this is actually made, with, this picture here is made with granite blocks. Uh, you can use any kind of angular stone, uh, even bricks. If you want more design ideas, uh, I recommend just Google searching herb spirals and you'll see a lot of creative designs, things for children to make as well. Um, but this is the one I use in my book as an example because it's very straightforward. You don't need to have any stone work or any knowledge uh, about how to work with stones to build one of these. Now, this is dry stack, uh, meaning that I, you place the stones in place, then you fill in the earth. And then you it, and it explodes uh, because you basically have a, of a of a really nice raised bed here. Your soil is loose. All that stone creates uh, sort of a, a microclimate that allows things to heat up early in the spring. And it goes late into the fall, sometimes into the winter. And I've had things over winter in the spirals that that would die you know, in the ground nearby because of that microclimate effect. Now, the dry stack and a lot of having a lot of this masonry in it, and then not so much soil really, because you're infilling, means that I choose drought tolerant plants generally for this design. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of Mediterranean herbs uh, at the top where it's very sunny and windy, a great place for your rosemary, and your time uh, coming around to the east facing uh, you can put in more of your parsley things that you know might appreciate a little bit of afternoon sun so what you have going on here is all multiple microclimates as you spiral around and here's the back of it uh, again that south facing great place to put in your stage lavender and then as it goes low down toward the north a little more cool you could maybe do your land cress uh, really you can create a cornucopia uh, of herbs plantings in one of these. 
If you don't have a sunny spot, you could put your hosta collection in here. Really, it does not have to be an edible design. You'll get a lot of ecological benefits by having all of this stone. It creates habitat. Uh, for official insects, for salamanders, lizards, things that will help balance the insect ecology for your landscape. So this really stacks a lot of functions as well as just being beautiful. It creates a focal point uh, in a landscape. I really encourage people to kind of put them maybe in their flow paths toward the kitchen or outside the kitchen so they can see it, run out, pick something, coming in from work, pick something. Uh, again, if you don't have sun, put your fiddlehead ferns in there. You can be really creative with this. It doesn't have to be edible. Uh, a little illustration out of my book. Again, just kind of reiterating some of the ideas. You could put a little pond at the bottom there. Uh, something, you know, that also creates habitat for the amphibians. Uh, really, it's, it's a fun design to play with. And it creates really curvy architecture which I think most of our landscapes uh, are really kind of desperate for uh, in a world that's that's kind of gone square. It's nice to cut in the curves and bring in the, um, the spiral energy. It really does make a difference. This is a very urban design. Uh, this is Baltimore. And I went more with a Fibonacci uh, design with this spiral. And this is right by the front door. Uh, the client was very busy, wanted to be able to sort of pick what she needed on her way in to eat dinner. And since this has a lot more space on the inside of it, it's able to grow tomatoes uh, and cucumbers and basils and actually be like a little garden herb and garden spot, right, uh, right where it's needed. Uh, so you can, again, play with the design. And then here is a really large one that I was uh, commissioned to do for a park uh, here in Frederick, Maryland. This one's actually 12 foot uh, in diameter and is the centerpiece of a butterfly garden. And this is what I call a free form herb spiral or garden spiral in the sense that instead of dry stacking the stones first, I actually dumped about six yards of mixed compost and soil and then shaped it into the spiral and then began placing the stones around the shape. In this way, you can use a variety of different types of stones. They don't even need to be super angular. Uh, since they're not really needing to hold themselves up, you can slightly lean them in. And this has a couple of benefits. It obviously gives you a lot more soil to plant into. Basically, this could grow a tree. It could grow bushes. Uh, it's going to hold a lot more moisture, yet have a lot of those benefits you get from uh, the masonry in that microclimate. And again, great habitat, uh, insect and ecology habitat. Here's another one. That's a free form. So this is in a thin backyard. You can see on either side of the picture, that's the fence. So the client here uh, said, I've ardent, and, and, but I've only got this one spot that gets enough sun. And I said, well, great, let's maximize that. And let's do a spiral because you're getting upwards of nine times the growing space for the footprint as you spiral upwards. So here uh, we used four yards of uh, mixed compost and soil and then dry and then not sorry then we um, free formed around that and now grows all of her garden needs and all of her herb needs so really it can it can it can be a diversity of uses in this picture i love because uh, a couple months after my book came out the first chapters on building herb spirals someone sent me this picture said loved your book look what i built uh, and this is up in Pennsylvania. And one of the things I like about this is, look, they, they pretty much put ornamentals in there, which is fine. Uh, you know, it's whatever they want. But the fact that it creates this, this archetypal point and, again, has, has all that habitat built into it uh, will make a difference. So. These are two pawpaws sitting on a swale uh, with a lead plant between them. So the lead plant in the middle is a nitrogen fixing species from the plains uh, out in the Midwest. It is an amazing grower that I use as a nurse plant or a companion plant at the early stages of planting my fruits and nuts uh, in the sense that it is fixing nitrogen through its roots in these little nodules that get released out into the soil level where the pawpaw or my other fruit trees are growing to attach and to absorb them. 
And right after I took this picture, I went and cut this, this lead plant in half. I took off that whole top half and I let that drop as living green mulch right where it was needed. And at the same time I do that, the corresponding roots underground die off and then they release that nitrogen. So in one fell swoop, I am fertilizing and I'm mulching. So this is a great little small example of using plants uh, in a permaculture design that helps support it. So it's like a little ecology versus our more linear system of gardening, which is, you know, has become, you know, buying stuff from the store, bringing it, applying it and kind of continuing that model where where we're quite on the hook uh, for doing a lot of the work. Whereas if we design with the plants and doing a little bit of earthwork shaping, that's the swale part, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, that combination creates a natural system that that really flourishes for itself, which means that you can go swing in the hammock, go do yoga, whatever. You're not on the hook to be constantly maintaining this. You've set the systems up to feed themselves. And this really does work. I, I've, I've proven this. And, and, and when I do design, I often say I design for neglect meaning that even with the best intentions, we may not get around to doing all that we'd hoped. Uh, so set that into the design so that it's going to be resilient naturally, doesn't take a lot of extra inputs and flourishes. Uh, and I know this from setting up our food forest systems and then starting to build our house. Uh, it took me four years to build that house and I neglected you know, the, the food forests and all the systems that I'd set up completely and yet they thrived. Uh, so I've kind of, you know, by, by default there, I, I've really shown that this is a great um, approach. Okay, so the swale idea. The swale idea is a, uh, a dugout basin and then a corresponding downhill berm. So this is on contour, which means that you're going perpendicular to the slope. And you're digging out that basin, putting that soil on the downhill to create a raised bed. I often then fill that dugout basin with wood chips. And as water comes down and falls into the basin, since it's on contour, perfectly level, that water stops and it sinks in. It sinks in and hydrates down through the root zone and is held in the water table perfectly for the plants, not just on that raised berm, but for 20, 30 feet down slope, your whole landscape gets hydrated. This single design aspect dramatically changes landscapes. It improves soil uh, health and it makes plants, whether that's your grass, your rose collection, or your fruit trees or garden, flourish. Uh, I use this probably in 70 plus percent of my designs because of how amazingly effective it is. And of course, you can sometimes in conditions where space is tight and you want to move water away from a certain zone coming towards your house, you can play with this design by going off contour and then on contour when you're possible. It's a variation of the rain garden, uh, the terrace. It's really just working with water uh, so that it's not a challenge, but a resource. And then they're beautiful. They're sinuous. They follow the landscape. So even if someone doesn't know what they're looking at in your in your landscape that are swales, they'll just they'll they'll just think how beautiful because it just fits because it's flowing with the landscape. Um, this is this is the backyard of um, Volt Courtyard. So Volt Restaurant in Fredericks. Uh, pretty well known uh, because of uh, chef Brian Voltaggio. He's one of the top chefs. So when I moved back uh, from living in Latin America uh, for 18 years, I, uh, he called me up. He said, hey, uh, I want you to come help design the courtyard here. And when I got there, the back was kind of washed out from the parking lot, runoff, and there was an old uh, English walnut, which is kind of rare, and a big maple tree. And so to harvest that water and to maximize that space and it being shady, we created a woodland uh, edible garden back there. And this tear shaped uh, rain garden in the, in the very beginning here captures a lot of that runoff. And then what overflows from that gets caught into the swales so that this is also functioning to help mitigate, filter uh, and utilize, you know, the runoff 
that was coming into it. So it's a stacking function, you know, to to take care of our environments uh, and then yet, you know, make it very productive. All the wood chips in there create fungal environments that also can break down any kind of toxins that are coming in. Uh, it's just it's it's just multifunctional, beautiful, and then of course very tasty. Okay, so it doesn't always have to be edible to really have you know a lot of value. So these two small swales are right outside of a client's house that loved you know tulips. So I was like, fine, okay, you want to steward the runoff from your roof and from your yard. You want to cleanse it. You want to make sure that it's not just racing off into the watershed. Let's cut a couple of small swales here. And then, yeah, that's what you would like. You're still getting so much benefit and function from having those swales in place. And they can be very small. I mean, a swale could be six feet. It could just be like a smiley face uh, just down from the downspout of your house. Uh, helping to sort of sink that water and cleanse it and then create a great growing opportunity. So I, I think these are very ecological. Uh, and then, of course, they, they, can, they can also be edible. This is a design that I'd create uh, here, I think, in Tacoma Park, sort of a more northern D.C. neighborhood uh, where they had a lot of water coming in. And we had to really in very front left corner here, you see some stones. Uh, sometimes when you have water coming in strongly that you can't mitigate before it gets to your property, you want to slow it down, begin to spread that force. Uh, so there's a couple of tricks to adding in if, you, if you've got a lot of water coming in. And some of these are actually slightly off contour so that the water continues to move a little bit. But by the time it comes out the end, it's all been absorbed. So uh, very beautiful, very functional. On a larger scale, this is out near Shepherdstown in West Virginia. Uh, this client really wanted to steward all of the runoff from her property and the stuff coming in, the water coming in from the neighboring property. Uh, so we swaled it. And you can see how sometimes the contour can change uh, depending on the slope. So these are all on contour. Uh, and these are rather large in that they were to become a food forest. Uh, now they are a food forest. They're planted with fruit trees and companion plants, ground covers, uh, all kinds of fruit bushes. And you see, we've just started to fill in the wood chips in the basin there. But ideally, that basin gets filled all the way up with organic matter uh, because that becomes eventually part of the compost building for the raised bed next to it. It begins to break down and become very rich. Sometimes I'll come through about every 18 months and I'll just dig, you know, I'll take that what was once wood chips or cardboard and straw and leaves is broken down and it's right there and I'll flip it right onto the bed next to me. So it's in place and then I'll relay wood chips or cardboard or organic matter, leaves, whatever I have. And in that sense, I'm creating compost in place and I've got it right where I need it. And then also just it, it expands that region of humidity and fertility for whatever's growing on the beds can the root systems can start to you know get into that juicy compost right next door from the basin so i'll tell you there's just so many benefits uh to designing like this um this is our garden up here uh you know we have like a woodland setting so our aesthetics are a little different and if you look closely i always keep my gardens covered i don't like to have my soil exposed uh, so you got a lot of straw here, but if you can look closely, you can kind of see the, the basin, you know, sort of that valley and then the raised beds, the ridges, and they're one after the other, after the other, after the other, after the other, most of the water's being first one. And, but these ridge and valleys all the way through create microclimates, hold moisture, build organic matter and fertility so that the whole garden zone actually becomes uh, humid, it becomes one large uh, fertile zone and things grow wonderful out of this garden. I hardly do anything but stick things in and come back and harvest. Uh, again, uh, having constant organic matter is very important. You really don't want your soil soda and your fungi to dry out and die. They are the essence of, of good, healthy soil. So keeping them covered uh, like a roof is very important. Uh, maintaining that constant moisture for them uh, will we'll pay back dividends uh, in, in how things grow and become more disease resistant as well, uh, and even insect resistant. Again, one of the tricks to the insect balance is having habitat, having beneficial habitat for 
for the predators. Um, so, you know, that can be perennial plants. Uh, that can be the herb spirals. We're going to talk about hugel culture beds. Uh, a lot of things, just, just stacks of stones and stacks of sticks. Don't clean up your garden and your landscape completely at the end of the season. Leave space for beneficials to be there. They will help balance the insect ecology uh, in ways that we can't. Uh, even with, you know, going out there and spraying all kinds of stuff, which I never recommend. Uh, if you're spraying stuff, it's a lack of design. Uh, it's just a matter of, of getting these things in place to start with. And then life is, is much better for everything. Um, let me see what else did I want to say about this. Um, oh, so this is, this is different than the raised beds that, that a lot of people migrate toward, which is, you know, just wood, you know, you, you create a wooden box and you put soil in it. And, and granted that's a step in the right direction in the sense that you're not compacting your soil and you're not walking on it, but literally that's blocking water flow. You know, your, your wood is not allowing sort of natural water flow to come in. Those raised beds dry out very quickly. Um, so I encourage people to consider this as a raised bed, you know, this as your raised bed design uh, that will really benefit you and everything you grow. Okay. Mushrooms. So outdoor growing mushrooms is actually very easy. Uh, and for the mid-Atlantic region, many regions with high rainfall and humidity, it is an easy to grow food. Uh, so a lot of folks say to me, oh, I can't grow anything in my yard. It's too shady. And I get this big smile. And I'm like, no, it's perfect. Mushrooms. Uh, it, you know, a lot of people call the mushrooms a fruit. You know, you're fruiting mushrooms. Uh, so it's a food that we can grow abundantly uh, in our shady, woody environments. Uh, and you'd be surprised how easy some of them are. Um, it, this is a disclaimer, though. Because once you start growing mushrooms, uh, <laughs> you can get really excited uh, because it's amazing how much they produce uh, with very little input. So the one of the main ways that I grow mushrooms is on logs uh, and wood chips. So the log method really is, is starting out with hardwoods. In the case of shiitake, uh, oak is great. Uh, in the case of oyster mushrooms, things like tulip poplar are great. Uh, really, many of our hardwoods will will grow different types of mushrooms. But shiitakes and oysters are about the easiest ones to grow, and they are also the tastiest, which is great. Uh, but basically, you're getting dormant, healthy wood. Uh, you're drilling it in a pattern uh, like this so that you can inoculate it with little wooden dowels. These little wooden dowels get hammered in. They have the mycelium. They have the fungi on them. So it's like the little seeds, the strain of that, let's say, that, that, that oyster mushroom. It's going to now hop off of that into the log, and it's going to digest the woody material, the lignin, the cellulose. And when it's really happy, it's going to – well, then you got to wax it over just to kind of seal it in. And then when they're happy, they just start flushing mushrooms. Um, and now it'll typically take about a year from when you inoculate, but then you're done. You don't have to do anything else except for put it in a nice moist spot. You don't have to re-inoculate, you don't have to redo anything, and your logs will flush at least twice a year for anywhere from three to eight years, uh, depending on the size of your log and the type of mushroom. But that's very little input for a lot of return. And these mushrooms are delicious. You, you can't buy these in the store. Uh, the stuff we buy in the store is grown on sawdust and wood blocks and warehouses. And I'm, I mean, they're still good. I, I eat them when I run out of my own, but these are exquisite. I mean, the flavor profiles, I mean, it's just, it, and they're grown in the elements. So all of that is in there. So I highly encourage this. I actually teach workshops uh, in the in the early spring and then in the late fall, we usually do a mushroom workshops. We have a couple coming up uh, here this fall as well where we drill the logs and everyone gets to take one home as well. So it's really easy to learn. Uh, and, and then again, we're in a perfect environment for growing mushrooms. Another one of my favorite mushrooms is called the wine cap. As you can see, it's got a beautiful burgundy top. This is kind of a terrestrial fungi in the sense that it likes to grow in organic matter, wood chips and straw. Uh, it's also called garden giant uh, because it works so well within gardens as well. Um, to create a patch, this is out of my book, really, it's about wood chips. Uh, you can lay down straw, 
um, and then cardboard as well. All of these are rich in you know lignin and cellulose that the fungi love to eat. And you will get hundreds of these wine caps from creating these patches. And they are delicious. They're very meaty, much like a portabella, uh, and can get up to like five pounds in size, but are really nice when they're smaller and the caps are, are not yet unfurled. Uh, and you can retrofit around an existing tree by doing this. Uh, so say you have an old apple tree that needs mulch anyway, you could go ahead and you could do a big um, patch of these under it, and that would benefit the tree. It would create fungal networks for the tree. It would mulch and hold down moisture, and then it would give you the mushrooms at the same time. Uh, so again, a lot of stacking functions with the fungi uh, in the sense that it, it builds good soil, fertility, holds moisture, and then creates an awesome medicinal edible um, you know, fruit, so to say. All right. So this is a picture of a food forest. So a food forest is not grown, is, is not grown in the forest. It's grown like the forest. So if we observe natural, healthy ecosystems, and we see all the relationships that are happening in a, in a healthy forest. We have overstory, midstory, understory trees. We have shrub layer. We have vines. We have ground cover running through the whole thing. We see all that working intimately. And if we take that and say, okay, well, how do I design for my fruit trees or for the things that I want to plant using that model. And basically what we do is we create these little ecosystems. So it simplifies itself. We take away maybe all the upper layers and work more with the mid and the understory layers uh, so that we make sure we get plenty of light for our fruiting species. So let's take, for example, let's say this fruit tree in the middle, let's say it's a Che fruit, C-H-E, wonderful fruit in the mulberry family. Highly recommend you looking that one up. Um, as our main our main fruit producer. So instead of sticking it out in the middle of the lawn, maybe with a couple inches you know, of mulch, let's go ahead and create a patch for it. Let's create a little ecosystem for it. And so a food forest can literally be eight feet by eight feet. You don't need a lot of space. It's a concept uh, of diversity. So your fruit trees in the middle, and then we want to plant the things that it's going to need. We mentioned earlier things that fix nitrogen. Let's get nitrogen fixers in that root zone. Let's get things that are going to draw in beneficial insects, things we call insectary plants, things like yarrow, which has a really cool um, architecture. Spiders love it, beneficial spiders. Pollinators, echinacea, tixie, coreopsis. Let's get them in there. Let's get more insect activity. Let's get more pollination and fruit set. Uh, let's get mulch in there. Let's get things like comfrey, things that are going to, you know, after they die, they come back and feed the soil. So it's like planting your mulch in place. Uh, strawberry is why the tree is young, is a great ground cover. So really, it's, it's not super important exactly what you're going to plant here. I encourage you just to kind of go for it, learn from it. Um, really, you're creating diversity instead of just kind of having just a fruit tree all by itself. So there's, it's hard to go wrong. Keeping those nitrogen fixers in there is very helpful uh, and creating sort of a good fertile soil to start with so it can handle having all these plants is another part that also dovetails with holding moisture. Uh, and I'll talk about that here in a minute, how we create these food forest patches. But here's an example of a young patch uh, out in one of our food forests many years ago. And, and in the center of this little patch, it's kind of hard to see, but there's a, a young jujube tree. Another fabulous fruit for our regions, the jujubes. Um, but we have a lot of deer. So it's like, okay, so I'm going to design this food forest patch to be things that I want to harvest and utilize, but then also to stack as a sort of living deer fence. So starting in sort of the top up right hand corner here, we've got Egyptian walking onion. Awesome, perennial, funky, funky, funky uh, vegetable that puts on this this, uh, this, these little bulbs in its head, and it looks like it's from outer space, and then it gets heavy and it falls down and it roots, and that's how it walks. And these can be harvested almost year round. I highly recommend these deer, don't eat them, love it. Next to that, coming down toward the center of the picture is a very spiky gooseberry. It's a very thorny, 
deer come up to that and they poke their nose like oh no this sucks i'm moving on they come to the the the, the very middle here and it's sage they don't like aromatic herbs next to that's wormwood an awesome medicinal and they're like ah, not having that more egyptian walking onion and they've walked on and they never got to the juicy jujube in the middle so you can have fun with this uh the perennial companion plants uh in permaculture we call these guilds um, these food forest patches can really kind of be what draws you in, maybe what you will utilize uh, and harvest from. And then you see a little baby pawpaw over here in the, in the far right sitting on the swale. And in the very back of this picture, you can see a little bit of the hugoculture bed, which I'm going to talk about. But you can see sort of the, the raised bed back there with a little bit of wood in it. All right, I'm getting excited here. Hold on. Okay. So the food forest can really fit almost any landscape. This is actually right next to a pool. Uh, and we've got figs, we've got rose hips, uh, we've got different types of herbs and alpine strawberries down in there. That's a hardy kiwi arbor in the background. Um, so really this can be very malleable. It can go along a fence line. It can really fit into existing landscapes in a myriad of ways. I've even done espalier, uh, you know, apples and pears, and then I've done, com you know, little food forest companion plants with them as well. So I really think there's there's opportunity for this this concept to graft into uh, e even even the most manicured type settings. All right. So Mike's Deluxe Sheet Mulch is a recipe from my book uh, that's really kind of uh, a jump starter for creating a, a healthy soil. Most, uh, most areas do not have healthy soil. We usually have you know, compacted earth and grass and weeds. So you can start right on top of the grass and right on top of the weeds by doing a very thick sheet mulch. Sometimes this is also known as lasagna gardening, uh, very similar in that we're creating layers of organic matter that with time break down into sort of compost and hold moisture. Now I like to go deluxe in the sense that I like to add the wood chip layer in, a good solid four inches of wood chips. This will give you almost two years of soil building in one go. So you're laying this down, ideally you're letting it sit for a year before you begin planting into it. Though you can go ahead and you can retrofit something you've already planted with one of these, it will, it will only benefit it. Um, but this will begin to break down and continually feed the soil cycles and build fertility and hold moisture. It'll act like a big sponge. Uh, so here's a couple patches, uh, for a client. This is typical spacing about 20 feet for small fruit trees. Uh, just put this in place and you could do a different aesthetic covering. You could cover this with regular mulch if that's what fits for your site. Uh, but getting those layers in there. Uh, whatever you have. If, if you're going to let it sit and you've got access to manure, put that down, put down your compost, newspaper, cardboard, wood chips, straw. Uh, be careful with too many leaves. Uh, a lot of times leaves will mat together and create almost an impenetrable uh, layer. So be, be careful with your leaves. If you're going to use leaves, try to mix it up with other materials uh, so that you avoid getting that mat effect. And then of course you could cover it with a nice mulch. Uh, you could create an island. This could this could be carved out. You could edge the edge it, and you could make an island that looks like a beautiful uh, manicured landscape design. Yet it's it's stacked in there to begin building fertility. Uh, here's an, this, an example of two patches at our place that have running comfrey in it. So I've got many types of comfrey. I have a couple that are running which I love because they help me uh, maintain my spaces. They, as they die down, they, they feed the soil. And these will actually grow up. They'll sprout up quickly in the spring. They'll put out the first flowers. Wonderful pollinator. All the bees, uh, solitary and the honeybees, they just flock all over this. It's one of the first foods for them. And then about August, it'll die back down and create this, this, this mulch mat, and then it'll reshoot itself. Um, and it just does this pulsing to where it's actually feeding the soil cycles and providing all this bee fodder. Uh, it's also great animal fodder. We have lots of deer, but they don't keep up with it. So it does, but it does provide food for them. These two patches are about 15 feet apart. Uh, I've got young pawpaw trees in the center of them. 
The large tree to the left is a black walnut. So yes, pawpaws grow well with black walnuts. So do mulberries, so do persimmons, so do gummy berries. Many, 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 many things grow with black walnuts. Do not be afraid. Okay, hardy kiwi, uh, also known as kiwi berry, uh, is a very ornamental vine, uh, actually brought into the country originally uh, as an ornamental. Actually, I think a lot of it came in through DC. There's some, there's some famous uh, varieties. Uh, I think Dunbar Oaks is from the DC area. Uh, anyway, it's a cousin to the fuzzy, but it's skin in the size of a very large grape, uh, and you eat the whole thing. Uh, you can see it here in the bottom. Sometimes, like I say, called kiwi berry. It's delicious. It has it has all the flavors, all the sweet flavors of the kiwi without the acidity. And then it's got a smooth skin, so you just keep eating them until you get sugar belly. <laughs> and they're super productive. Um, so, and ornamental. You see how beautiful those are. But you must be prepared if you're going to plant these. Think of wisteria with like 100 pounds of fruit on it. They are very productive and they are very opportunistic growers. Um, so there's one variety called Asai. It's a Japanese variety, I-S-A-I-I, -I -I, that is self-fertile and a little less vigorous. So I might recommend, especially if you're in zone seven or, or warmer, uh, to try maybe the single Asai, uh, but build a good structure for it. This is actually a picture of, of hardy kiwis that are pretty well maintained as a hedge, which means that they're cut back during the growing season as well as when they're dormant. So you can kind of use it as a hedge and, and cutting it back can actually help stimulate the fruiting for you. So, uh, but if left to its own, it, it can kind of, kind of go wild. Uh, and they're harvesting uh, now in sort of early October for us. Uh, and you want them to almost be a little wrinkly uh, so if you see these for sale in the grocery store and they look wrinkly, that's OK. That's what you want. Uh, go ahead and try them and buy them. Uh, and I do recommend them as a very beautiful ornamental. They make great shade structures. I use them for pergolas, uh, for sitting areas. Uh, they're just beautiful to look at, uh, to have. This is what I typically build for, a, a, you know, a, if I do a single male and a single female. Uh, if you are going for something other than the Asai, uh, you do need one male pollinator for about six or seven females in the area. Um, and I build usually these with black locusts uh, so that it's really sturdy and can hold that weight. Remember, a female can produce 100 pounds of fruit. Uh, if I'm doing a male and a female, I will train uh, the cordons, the permanent arms, uh, so that there's really maybe only one or two of the male and then most of uh, the pergola would be for the female, for the fruit. All right, so Hugo culture. Hugo culture, uh, Germanic word uh, meaning, you know, wood covered with soil. Uh, this is what happens naturally in the forest. If you've been in an ancient forest and you look at the ground and it's all lumpy, uh, those are trees that have fallen. Then over decades, leaves have fallen on them and they're starting to compost down. If you go and you kick one of those, it's just black and rich and teeming with life. This is a natural process that we can... Uh, work with, imitate on our landscapes, which are very rich in wood. Uh, a lot of times people don't know what to do with all the wood, so they're, they're exporting it. And really, you don't want any organic matter to leave your site. You want that to stay, to build, hum you know, um, fertility, fungal networks. You want your landscape to be filled with organic matter. So a way to do this is to take your cuttings, and this is a larger one, but you could do it with small prunings. You can do a small bed, uh, and basically you can dig out and put this wood in the soil you've dug out with first you take the sod and you put the sod back on upside down then you put the soil on top of that and your this will then begin over a season or two to drop down as it becomes compost in place and then when you come and you plant into this it has all of the all of the moisture and all of the fertility that your plants will need they'll be super happy and they'll thrive uh, so again this is a way of imitating natural uh, patterns in our landscapes to help us grow uh, without much input. It's working with the natural cycles and flows. This is a smaller one. This is from Usuri Harvey. He's a Northern Virginia grower. Um, and he, in his garden bed, has just used small prunings and allowing that to break down. So it can be any scale that you have. It's the concept of maintaining and working with and composting uh, all of these resources that we have. And 
here's one of my Hugo culture beds. The one that was in the back of the picture I showed you earlier. Uh, it was five feet tall when I built it and it's now about two and a half feet tall. It's now about six years old and it's just perfect now where I come in and I can stick in jujubes. Uh, I'm starting to stick pawpaws in down here at the base of it. Uh, you can see the Egyptian walking onion in there now and some of the comfrey as the early plants. Uh, so it's just a wonderful way to also put yourself in the cycles uh, of succession. So I really highly recommend this. In the early years of a hue culture bed, while there still might be some movement, I would recommend, um, you know, putting things in like berries uh, or bushes, things that can maybe adapt to that movement. And then once it settles, you could start putting in more permanent trees or I'll put in permanent trees at the beginning down here at the bottom where the soil is kind of deeper. And then the roots from those trees can tap into that hue culture compost uh, and fertility and moisture um, right away. All right, here's a cool diagram that kind of starts stacking all of these functions together. We have the swale. You can do the swale combination with a hugelkultur bed. So when you dig your swale out, you could combine that on contour with some hugelkultur by putting wood in there. You could put your food forest on the back side of that. Uh, this is this is an adaptation of Bill Mollison, one of the founders of permaculture. One of his diagrams. Um, if you're into more stack design, I highly recommend. Uh, exploring permaculture, it will give you the tools uh, to be adaptive regardless of where you're at on this planet. Uh, it's such an amazing design approach uh, because it really doesn't have any limitations or ceilings. It's really observing uh, and interacting uh, with natural cycles.